And uh, grab your Bibles, Romans chapter number 12 is where we're going to be tonight. And I want to say uh, thank you so much for coming back uh, tonight. It means a lot. We've just been uh, showered with love and affection uh, from our church family here. And uh, I'm so grateful for our, uh, for our time here. And uh, we've really enjoyed it. I feel like uh, the Lord has... Uh, blessed, ordained it, and, and uh, we've been able to do some pretty special things. And uh, so I just want to say thank you uh, once again uh, to those uh, who I've been able to serve with, who have served me and, uh, and my family. And it means a lot. Uh, it, it's often said, if, if, you know, if you want to do good um, to, a, to a man or, you know, uh, to someone who has a family, do, do good to their kids, be good to their kids. And uh, I just feel that that is the, I mean, just anywhere you look around here, uh, you know, you guys are, are stopping the girls and giving them gifts or um, uh, just, you know, showing them love and affection. And I'm just so grateful. For, I, I couldn't ask uh, for more, for better. So thank you so much uh, for that. And it just, I'm over the moon. Uh, and uh, so I, it's overwhelming. I really appreciate it. I want to give a shout out to my VIP section down here and uh, much love. And that's uh, a good deal. And I'm excited uh, to be preaching tonight. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. Uh, to preach tonight, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to air out all the dirty laundry. We're going to get it all out there. I'm just kidding. Not really. And uh, I, got, I have nothing bad. I don't have anything bad to say, nothing negative to say at all. Uh, I, I really have, the last two and a half years, uh, really have been a dream come true for us. And uh, the doors that have been opened, and uh, uh, I said last Wednesday night, is that right? We announced it last Wednesday or the Wednesday before? The Wednesday before. Oh, gotcha. Two, two weeks ago, we announced... Uh, to the youth group on Wednesday night, uh, you know, that we, that we were going to be making a change, right? Okay, good. And, uh, and I told the, uh, the young people, and I'll tell you guys now, uh, we've done, we've been able to do a lot of really cool trips and, uh, and go cool places and, and do a lot of neat things and, uh, and, and things that I've never heard of other places doing because uh, they're kind of, you know, like either they're expensive or they're crazy or, you know, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but we do them anyways. And, uh, but that's, um, that's in large part uh, due to Pastor Mark just giving us a green light in a lot of different areas. And uh, so I'm, I'm grateful uh, for that, uh, that flexibility and, and the freedom and uh, that he's given us in our uh, ministry here. So uh, thank you so much, Pastor, for that. Romans chapter uh, 12 is where we're going to be tonight. And uh, like uh, Pastor said, I'm not going to be long. Uh, but I do have a truth that I want to share with you, and uh, we'll get to the party. All right, Romans 12, verse number 1. The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful to you, that we, one, that we can come before your throne and ask you anything. And God, thank you that you rule supreme over our lives. We're grateful uh, for your hand of protection uh, around us. And God, we're, we're just so grateful that you even care at all, that you love us and are invested in us. I pray that you uh, help us tonight as we study these two verses, great verses of Scripture. Help me to do it justice. And God, I pray that we would leave better than we came. In Jesus' name. Amen. And these are uh, famous verses. You've heard these before, and, uh, and and we've preached on them before. And and if you've been to church any amount of time, you know that these are, are really kind of core verses uh, to the Christian faith. The, and they deal with a very important topic, the will of God. What is the will of God uh, for us? And when I was young, my pastors, my youth pastor, my assistant pastors, and my senior pastor, they all emphasized heavily the will of God. And often, especially when talking to us young people, I remember in, in high school, often, uh, when they would ask us individually, they would ask us in, in form of a, uh, of a sermon, what, uh, are you pursuing the will of God? What is the will of God for your life? Have you determined what the will of God is? And that's not an uncommon thing. And I talk about this often uh, with our young people. And, uh, but they stress for us to understand that God loves us and has a plan uh, for our lives. So we should do what we can to follow it. And there's all kinds of theories about, well, is there just one a will of God? I, I, tell, uh, I tell Jamie all the time. It's like, you know, because sometimes 
I go a little crazy, you know, with, this is probably on the last Sunday I'm allowed to say stuff like this. Uh, sometimes I go a little crazy uh, with my theology, and I think, man, I wonder if this might be true. And so, you know, like the concept of a soulmate, is there just one person that you're supposed to love for the rest of your life? Or, like if you never, you know, like if I never went to college at Howes Anderson, will I, would I have met Jamie? Probably not. And so does that mean that there was nobody else that I was supposed to love for the rest of my life? I don't think so, you know, that gets me in trouble. Don't repeat that. And uh, so I didn't say it, delete it from the live stream, okay? And, uh, uh, and that's, you know, all kinds of questions like that. Like, what is the will of God? Can you determine it? How can you find it? And uh, so, uh, uh, but, but I do believe when we follow what he has for us to do, then he will be with us and uh, we'll be okay. When we don't follow God's plan for us, we will experience hardship and struggles that we otherwise wouldn't. I do think that if, if we constantly just go against uh, the Bible, we go against, we don't live the way that God wants us to or calls us to, then we bring on ourselves hard times and struggles. I 100% I uh, believe that. And so I can give credit to this line of thinking. We know that Philippians 4 says that God gives believers peace that is outside of the bounds of our own comprehension. We can't even understand the peace that God gives us, the, 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 uh, the grace that God extends to us. It doesn't make any sense because we don't deserve it. And that's the, uh, obviously the, the underlying definition of, of that word grace is that we don't merit grace at all. Yet God uh, is, is kind enough to us, loves us enough to give it to us. Romans 5 says that the justified will have peace with God. And Psalm 143 says that the Spirit of God will lead us. So it makes sense to me to repeat often what my, what my pastors have told me, that the Lord gives blessings when we follow Him. And just to clarify just a little bit further, Philippians 4.8 the Bible says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And the next verse, verse number nine, gives just a little bit of clarification to that verse. So think on these things and these things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. So if you strive to live your life for God, if you focus on the things that God has for you, then God extends peace to us. On the contrary, John 3.36 says that whoever doesn't believe in Christ will experience the wrath of God. So we know that peace and a good life and the will of God is for all of those uh, who, who spend their life for God, who, who present themselves, if you will, a living sacrifice like Romans uh, 12, 1 and 2 is talking about. The peace of God and, and the grace of God is extended to all those who live their lives for God. However, if you don't, then the wrath of God uh, is extended onto you. Mark 16 says that those who don't believe will be condemned. So we have those specific verses, and then I think we can infer from the blessings that are promised to believers. If believers are promised peace, is it fair to say that unbelievers will have strife? I think it is. I, I think it, uh, that's fair uh, to draw that conclusion. For cultural context, lost people have always looked for what we would call the will of God. Believers understand that there is a, uh, uh, there's a higher being, there is a God, a, a Lord of our life, who, who uh, has a plan for us, loves us so much, sent his son to die for us. And we know that from uh, the beginning of eternity, which is a really a date, no, we know that, that God exists outside of time and space. But from, we, if you go back, uh, as far back as God allows us to go, right? Uh, you know, uh, millennia and, and eternity past, it was always determined that Jesus would come and die for us and that God uh, would save those who would believe and have a plan for their lives. So we know that. And people have always looked for meaning in this life. Unfortunately, so many look in the wrong places. According uh, to a Pew Research poll, when Americans describe what gives them meaning, they list family career and money all before they list faith 
family, career, and money, all before faith. Faith is number four on this list of uh, 10 things that Americans say give them uh, meaning. And so it's my opinion that Americans in particular, but people everywhere, understand that there is a God who sets the order of the universe. And I don't need to have an opinion about that because the Bible is clear about it. And uh, when uh, the Bible says something clearly, then it's not up to me anymore. Uh, then we just believe what the Bible says. And so uh, Romans 1.20 says that the invisible things of God are clearly seen. The attributes of God, uh, the, that grace that he extends, that love that he gives uh, to everyone uh, are clearly seen. Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of God. So anybody can look and see that God God is real and then that God is good and studies uh, more studies show that there are more people who identify themselves as atheists now than there ever have been in almost the history of the world more people now would describe themselves as atheists more now than ever before and I don't know that I believe uh, these studies I don't know that I believe that so many people uh, are atheists in a world that's uh, consistently and and constantly rejecting God and biblical precepts it's become easy to reject God it's be it's become uh, uh, you know part of our society part of the culture you're not cool if you uh, identify yourself as a Christian now it is uh, it is the the cool thing to do to say that I'm an atheist and if it came down, but if it came down to it, I don't know that all these people would deny God at the end. And how many times have you heard the stories of people who live their lives as atheists and then in that last second to cover, you know, to cover their bases, uh, they put, they express faith in Jesus. I, I don't know that as many people who say they're atheists actually are. I think, I think everyone uh, attributes this, the, this world, this life to God. And we know from scripture that everyone has an intrinsic understanding of God. It's, an, it's a natural a thing that we all have inside of us where we can all say and we can all admit that there has to be a God. There's got to be something. And we know this from Romans 2, verse number 14 and 15. These are great verses uh, to mark down and come back to later on. But Romans 2, 14 and 15, the Bible says, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts uh, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Even the unbeliever understands that on some level, God is real and his way is best. God is real and, and his direction is good for us. That's Romans 2, 14 and 15. Lays out clearly that every single person, Gentile, Jew, whoever it might be, believer, unbeliever, understands that there is a God who is responsible for all of this. It's written on our hearts. And it comes down to, for a lot of people who express uh, atheism, they say, uh, uh, you know, why do uh, good things happen to bad people? Or, and, and, and they might not understand why bad things uh, happen uh, to good people. But we know that God is sovereign over all. And I've, I've heard the answers, and I can even regurgitate some of them uh, for those questions. Why do uh, good things happen to bad people? They don't deserve it. They haven't earned those things. And we ask, why do bad things happen to good people? And I can tell you uh, why I think why. I can even show you a verse or two to help explain it. However, at the end of the day, it's still hard for me to comprehend that God would allow nice things for bad people. It doesn't really make sense to me why good people suffer. People all around the world who are trying to live for God. Why there's uh, persecution of uh, Christians and, and missionaries all around the world. Why do bad things happen to good people? I can understand why, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really make sense to me. Because if I were God, I, I would do it differently, right? And then, uh, of course, who am I to question God? But we know that God is sovereign over all, and we know that his love for us is eternal. So when it comes down to the will of God, it's not 
this magical, uh, unknown mystery that is concealed from us until the moment that you're in it. That's not what the will of God is. It's not this, you know, as a young person looking for the will of God, praying for the will of God to come about in my life. And it, the will of God didn't happen to me when I turned 22 and got married. And then shortly after that, uh, 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 you know, started having kids and all of that. that. That wasn't when the will of God kicked in for me. And I think that's important to distinguish because the will of God is right now, wherever you are in your life. That is what the will of God is for you. Romans 12, 1 and 2 gives us a map of how to be in the will of God, how to be in the will of God. Number one, we need to present your body a living sacrifice. And this is the concept that we are no longer our own. It's a, it's, it's a strange thought, and just bear with me for a moment, but it's a strange thought for free people to present themselves as slaves voluntarily. Right there, uh, I, I don't know of times in history where this has happened, but just for no reason, uh, out of the blue, where a free person said, I'd like to see what it's like to be a slave. That doesn't generally happen that often. Uh, we all like being free, right? I want to make uh, my own choices. And, uh, and as, even as a child, I remember back to when you were a child, and uh, you, you, we didn't want our parents bossing us around. We certainly didn't want older uh, uh, siblings bossing us around or anybody. We like uh, to be free. We want to make our own decisions. And, and more of my childhood than I care uh, to admit was spent being punished because I wanted to do my own thing. Am I right, Mom? Yes? There you go. Yeah, All right, she, she vouched for me, right? And uh, good. And so I spent a lot of time being in trouble because I tried to do my own thing. And guess what? It failed over and over again. And there's, I, have, I have many conversations uh, with my wife where I say, man, I wish I would have done that differently. Uh, and I wish I wouldn't have uh, tried to grab onto as much freedom as I just tried to grab onto because all I did was hurt somebody else or, or all I did was just mess up a good situation, but it's because I want to make my own choices. I want to live my own life. I don't want someone else to determine and, and to, di to dictate for me how I live my life. I want to be free, but all of us need to come to a point eventually where we understand that our lives are better off in the hands of God. All of our lives are better off in the hands of God. I can try to build my house on the sand, but when the struggles of this life and the trials that I'll go through beat like wind upon my house, it will fall. And that's what happens when I try to live my life in my own freedom. Under, under my own control, I can't hold up to the things that will come my way. My freedom doesn't get me but so far. But when I build my house on the foundation of the grace and love of God, I find that my house can withstand the beating. It can withstand the wind and the waves uh, that, that pound on my walls. And so when my life is given to God and, and I allow him uh, to lead me and control me and, and drive me, even as, uh, as a master would a slave, that is when I find real freedom, that spiritual freedom that God wants to give us. But that action of presenting ourselves to God is a choice that we independently make. And it's a, it's a choice that we make, sure, but really it's acknowledging the truth, and that is that we are bought with a price. We were never really our own person. So the more that we were uh, uh, fighting for our own freedom, the more we were fighting against what was actually happening. It's like uh, uh, I used to go into uh, a women's prison. My, my parents are here, and they did too, so they, they can uh, vouch for this story as well. And uh, we'd go into the women's prison, and, and, and you would ask, I can't remember exactly the joke, but the, 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 the premise of it was is that everybody in prison is innocent. Right? There's nobody in, in prison that is actually guilty of a crime, you understand. And so, uh, th but it's, it's like someone in prison saying, no, I, I should be free. I didn't do anything wrong. 
Well, of course he did. You got convicted. There was evidence that you were wrong and that, and that you violated a crime. And so now you're in jail. And so when I try to live my life under my own freedom, it's like pounding on the walls and, and, the, and on the bars of a prison saying, I should be free. I didn't do anything wrong. When in reality, we need to be a slave to Christ. And that's our situation. And when we can acknowledge that, that is when God gives us freedom. Jesus paid our debt and the Bible says we belong to him. And the life that he gives in this, uh, in this master-slave relationship, and obviously God wants so much more than that. He wants us to submit our, ourselves to him and our lives to him. And so that's when Jesus can, when we acknowledge that, that's when Jesus can become our friend. And that's when we can have a true fellowship and relationship with God, but it comes down to us acknowledging that, hey, my life would be much better if I would just allow God to control it. And the life that he gives is a beautiful thing. And so uh, it's presenting our lives, and then it's also giving up what we think is best. And that is the core of this truth, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, giving up what we think is best for us. When we present our bodies a living sacrifice, we're giving up what we think is best. Holding on to our lives is like holding on uh, to fistfuls of sand. And it's, you go to the beach and you scoop up a fistful of sand and you understand that the harder that you squeeze and the more that you try to contain those tiny, minuscule grains of sand, uh, the, the more falls through our hands. And so uh, when we give it to God, God contains it. Our lives are fragile and broken. If only God can make us new and give us a life even worth living. So present our bodies a living sacrifice. How to stay in the will of God. Number one, present your body a living sacrifice. Number two, don't be conformed to the world. Rather, be transformed to the image of God. Psalm 1, in verse, uh, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. To be in the will of God, we must not conform to the world. That's essential. We can't be what the world would have us to be. And this is, uh, unfortunately, where many believers go so wrong. We get enticed by the world. The world offers and presents many things, and on the surface, they're beautiful. And it looks like it might be good for us. But then you start to peel back the layers, and you find that those things that, from a, uh, from a distance or at, a, at first glance, were nice things and beautiful things, you peel back layers, and you find that this full of rot, is full of, it's been corrupted, it's no longer good. It's like, uh, it's like a child who uh, has, a, has a sucker, and, and they're, they love that sucker, and then it falls on the ground, and you pick it up, and you think, oh man, it's okay, and you stick it back in your mouth, and it's got hair and everything else on it, right? And you find that that really was ruined, <laughs> right? And so, <laughs> all right, that's a, that, was off, that was on the spot right there for you, okay? <laughs> good. So the world is appealing to the flesh, and it tells us that we can have all the things that we know to be temporal. I'm just thinking about a sucker with all kind of hair and dirt on it now, and I can't get past it. All right, let me, okay, here we go. The world is appealing to the flesh, and it tells us that we can have all the things that we know to be temporal and then disastrous. You know, the Bible does say there's pleasure in sin just for a season, though. So while it might be enticing and while it looks good, uh, it is unfortunate. Uh, unfortunately, it will destroy us. And you can recall, maybe some of you are thinking right now about the Garden of Eden, where they had so much. They were given this a beautiful life, this amazing place uh, uh, where they had uh, ultimate freedom. They walked and talked with God. What an amazing thing. But they were tricked into partaking of the one thing that was off limits. Much of what it means to be conformed to the world has much to do with what we don't do. <clears throat> Many times, we're worried about doing all the right things. And we get those things down. We know what to do so that others uh, understand, hey, that guy, he's got it all together. And uh, so uh, we know that it's right to show up 
on a Sunday morning uh, to church. And we even maybe come uh, to Bible study on Wednesday nights. And if you're real spiritual, you're back here on a Sunday night and you carry your Bible, you know how to present uh, yourself so that others think you have it all together. And look, those things are good and right. And there's much, many more things that we can list. Uh, and, and, and we understand the things that we know to do. It's important, but it's not everything. We need to look different than the world. So it's not just about what we do. It's about what we don't do as well. Our lives should truly reflect Christ and the work he's done on our heart, not the issues uh, and, and the evil of the world. This is a, a major issue I've, I've come to realize. We have no problem identifying ourselves with God, but when it comes to living the way that he calls us to, we struggle. Instead of delighting in the law of God, we walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, and sit in the seat of the scornful. So many of us are guilty of this, if not now, certainly at times. So present our bodies a living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed to the image of God. Number three, and lastly, we need to ask the Lord continually to be renewing our mind. 2 Corinthians 10, verse number 5. The Bible says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Lastly, if we want to be in the will of God, we need to have a renewed mind. In a spiritual war, we fight, among other things, bad ideas, and horrible theology. This, uh, this war, the Bible says, is not between flesh and blood. This is a spiritual war. And in a spiritual fight, we fight ideas and bad theology. In Paul's native land of Cilicia, pirates took refuge in these large uh, rock formations. And, and the Bible calls them uh, refuges, and uh, excuse me, fortresses. That's what the Bible calls them. And uh, they were large and, and rocky. And so it was hard, uh, to, uh, hard to get through. And, uh, and there was many places to hide. And so pirates had uh, taken refuge in them and had uh, kind of tormented this, uh, this town and this uh, country of, of Cilicia. One day, Roman armies finally took action and they destroyed the fortresses. They weren't going after the actual pirates. They destroyed the fortresses so the pirates had nowhere to hide. And so they cast down the strongholds and defeated the pirates. And maybe uh, this happened about uh, 50 years before uh, Paul was born, about 100 uh, BC. And so uh, it, it's often thought that maybe Paul um, uh, was recalling that story when he wrote uh, this verse in 2 Corinthians 10:5, casting down imaginations and, and the strongholds. And so, uh, but. Uh, they, so they cast on strongholds and defeated the pirates. So we need to throw down carnal thinking and allow the things of God to permeate our minds. We need to cast down worldly ideas and exalt the Lord in our minds. And then when we do that, he renews us. When we present our bodies a living sacrifice and we're transformed in the image of God and our minds are renewed, the Holy Spirit guides us in his will. So it's a process, certainly, but the will of God is more simple than we make it. The process is simple. It's not easy, though. It's a lifetime of decisions that are made with the intention of giving God the glory that he's due with our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful to come to you once again. I pray that you would help us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. God, that we would be uh, not conformed to the world, but be transformed in the image of God. God, I also pray that you would renew our minds daily. And that, God, that you would receive the glory that you're due. God, help us to live in your will. God, to follow you with everything that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I think you could preach that sermon right there once a month. And not, and, and. And it would be uh, as new every month as it was the last. That's, that's the problem. That's, it, it's, it's a f failure on our part to, uh, to yield. It's, we we want to conform to the world. The flesh does. And I don't want to re-preach it. But I'm just saying uh, you did a good job with that. 
And, uh, and I think that that is, a, that is a key. That is a key to the Christian life right there, Romans 1 and 2. All right. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. And I'm going to go ahead and pray for the food uh, right now so that when you hit those doors, you can just hit them running. And you can just, you know, just destroy that line in there that has all the food in it. And uh, thank you for being here tonight. What are you laughing about, Betty? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is no respecter of persons around here when it comes to food. Uh, thank you for coming out. Make sure to get by the hearse back there and, and shake their hand and uh, let them know, you know, that you're glad that they were here. And I'm glad. I'm glad you guys were here this weekend uh, to share in this. All right, let's pray. Father, we are thankful uh, for many things. And, and tonight we, we do say, I mean, sure, we're going to see, uh, we're going to see uh, uh, Jamie and Damien often. They're going to bring their kids here uh, Wednesday nights for Awana. I mean, and uh, they're not moving. We're going to bump into them. We're going to them. We're going to see them on purpose. Uh, and so, and that's a good thing. It's a sort of a comforting thing. We're not really saying goodbye. Uh, but I do want to say, Father, that I am appreciative of you bringing them our way over the last two and a half, a little more than two and a half years, and for their, uh, their investment that they made in this church. And, and Father, all the good that has been done and, uh, for, the, for the cause of Christ. And so very thankful for that. And I pray that uh, as they uh, move on now to that next chapter, and it's a chapter that you have written. It's a, it's, it's, you know, you've ended this one here, and you've began the next one. And there's no doubt in my mind and in their minds about that. And I pray your blessings upon them, uh, your wisdom, discernment, as they make a lot of big decisions right now. And uh, God, that um, well, that they'll stay as committed to Romans uh, chapter twelve, one and two, and I'm, and I'm, and I know they will. Uh, as Brother Damien here preached to us tonight, may we all be very committed to that truth. Bless them, though, and bless them kids. Uh, God, take care of them. Watch over them. Keep them safe. Father, thank you for this time now of fellowship that we're going to experience. Thank you for the food. And this little, uh, we won't think twice about it. We call it finger food. You know, there's a lot of people in this world that would call that a, 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 a bounty they would go in there tonight and they would look at that and think, oh my goodness, this is the best meal I've ever seen. And, and to us, it's finger food. And, and uh, God, forgive us for that. Help us to be very appreciative of every 